Thank you guys, appreciate it. How we doing tonight? Doing good? Can I just be honest with you for a second? Like, my favorite thing all week long is worshiping with you guys. Like, I'm, I'm not lying. I'm not just trying to make you feel good about yourself. Um, I'm just, I just want to, that, that's truth. Like, you guys encourage my soul um, when I see you worshiping, when I hear you worshiping. Um, it's just good. It's just good to come together as a family of God uh, and, and put our hearts and minds back on Jesus. So, as Trayvon said, we're kicking off a new series tonight. Let me, let me kind of give you kind of the why and the what behind this series. Like, why a series on the Holy Spirit? Well, there's, there's a couple reasons, but it started with the challenge that we talked about back in January here on this very stage about being curious with God this year. Like, not just like, you know, have your quiet time, read, check off the box, go to church, small group, whatever it is, but actually get curious. Like, when was the last time you felt curious? Like, I remember growing up reading Curious George. And he was hilarious, and he would be curious about things. I'm like, I would never be curious about that. But, you know, he's a monkey. So, But as we get older, we lose that wonderment that leads us to curiosity. And the greatest gift that I have come across recently is this mentality, is that when you think about God, when you read his word, read it with curiosity. Here's why I didn't do that. Number one, I didn't want to ever admit that I didn't know something I was reading. I didn't want to look stupid. I didn't want to look like that Christian who grew up his whole life in the church and didn't know. And so I refused to be curious because of my pride. I, didn't, I refused to be curious because, honestly, I didn't know how to find the answers anyway. If I had a question, who would I go to? Where would I go? Now, I'm speaking before Google existed, where literally everything that w- would be an actual book. You guys, do you guys know what an encyclopedia is, by the way? You guys, okay. Like, that, that's, that's how I did research papers. And so this idea of being curious seemed like a lot of work. But the amazing thing about technology today, and in a room like this, is we can come together and say, hey, we, we can help each other. We can jump on Google and ask Google, who is the Holy Spirit? And we're going to get resources immediately. Now, be careful. They're not all good resources. But that's where we're going to hit this topic. Because when I was growing up, I didn't read with curiosity. I read with pride, and I read with maybe just some laziness, if I'm really quite honest. And so what I'm excited about tonight is is to help us get curious. And so as I was reading um, earlier this year, there was one verse that stuck out to me above all others that piqued my curiosity. And I want to share that with you tonight. This is going to be our launching point for this whole series. Here's the picture of what's happening in John chapter 14 or 16. Jesus is in the upper room with, with his disciples. He is hours away from being crucified. He has spent three years with his boys, healing people, feeding 5,000, walking on water, doing incredible things talking about the kingdom of God. And so the disciples were like, yes, we are tired of Rome. They are oppressing us. They are occupying our country. We can't do anything without Rome's approval. And they were sick of it. And they knew the Old Testament. They were Jewish men. They grew up their whole life studying the Old Testament. And they knew the prophecies that, hey, there would be a Messiah that would come. And when Jesus started talking a certain way, they started saying like, what? Say that again? What do you mean? And they started to get excited because what they realized is the Messiah was one of their boys. Can you imagine? Can you just imagine for a second like all of a sudden you realize one in your friend group is the savior of the world that you and your people have been waiting for for hundreds of years? And so that's their mentality. They're like, let's go. They're in the upper room. They are in Jerusalem. And Jesus starts talking crazy. And here's one of the things that he says that is crazy, especially if you're the disciples. John chapter 16, at the very end of the upper room discourse, Jesus says to his disciples in verse seven, nevertheless, 
I am telling you the truth. It is for your benefit. Other versions say for your good. It is better or to your advantage that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. If I go, I will send him to you. What? What? Have you ever had a friend come visit you? You remember how excited you got when you were, like, I don't remember, for me, it's, it's that sleepover. When your parents say, yeah, you can have a sleepover, you're like, let's go, right? And the, the whole day, you are freaking out because your friend's coming over. You're gonna spend like five hours, maybe all night, eating Cheetos and video games. And then all of a sudden, what if they said, right as they were about to get, they're like, you know what, I'm gonna have to go now. It's actually better if I leave. As a little boy, I'd be like, What? You just got here. What are you talking about? And I have to believe that the disciples were having the same moment of crisis. They are in Jerusalem. They think Jesus is about to slay the dragon of Rome and take the, the, the Jewish people back to free them from oppression. That's what he said in Luke 4. I'm here to set the oppressed free. And then Jesus drops this. I'm telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. If I go, I will send him to you. How could it be to their benefit? They had to have been thinking, how is this advantageous for us? You're leaving? They've seen what Jesus did. They've heard what he said. This had to confuse them. Now, this is the end of the conversation. And that's why we're gonna talk about who is the Holy Spirit tonight. As we just talked about a minute ago, we're gonna hopefully introduce you to the Holy Spirit. Because if you're anything like me, I grew up hearing zip about the Holy Spirit. I mean literally nothing. It's like this mystical new age part of the Christian faith that we as good Christians, we just don't talk about. That's a slippery slope. And so I grew up in a denomination where we just talked about the Father and Jesus, and that was it. We gave like, okay, well, there is a Trinity, but really it's just, we're about, we're gonna be about two thirds of this Trinity, okay? That was my tradition growing up, and we just didn't engage it. We didn't understand it. Probably if I really knew the theology behind it, but we're not gonna go there tonight. So we're gonna talk about the, the Holy Spirit. So let's go back to the upper room. You remember when you were a kid and that first time you got lost and you didn't know where mom and dad went? Or for me, it was that when I got dropped off at college and you saw their car drive off and there's this moment of panic. You're like, oh no, I'm alone. <laughs> Do you guys remember that, anybody? Or am I alone, the only person ever feeling that? I experienced that this Sunday with my children at Target. We were walking around and one of my children could not find us. And so his phone was dead, of course. And so we start walking around, me and the other three, we're looking for our fourth. And we see him walking down, you know how the middle aisle, you can see all the way across the room, we see him. We yell out his name. And he comes running. This is not a small person, mind you. This is not my littlest, okay? comes running and his heart is beating, his breath is, he's like, I thought you guys left me. I'm like, what are you talking about? You're 16 years old. What are you talking about? You can drive yourself, like, it's just, anyway. But we have that, like, I don't care who you are. If you think you've been left behind, it's just like, oh. And I gotta believe the disciples are feeling this. So let's turn back to John 13 and 14. And I'm gonna walk you, we're gonna do an abbreviated walkthrough really quickly of this conversation of this, what I believe Jesus is first introduction of his disciples with the idea of the Holy Spirit. And their mind is blowing and you can see it happening in real time here. In John 13, 33, he's, he's having a tender moment. This is the upper room. This is his last meal with his boys. And he refers to them as children. He says, little children, I am with you for a little while longer. You will look for me. 
And just as I told the Jews, so now I tell you, where I am going, you cannot come. And then in John 14, one, just a few uh, verses later, he says, don't let your heart be troubled. Because he knew their heart was troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. You know the way to where I am going. And then Thomas in verse five says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Freak out number one. Jesus says, you know the way. Thomas says, no, we don't. What are you talking about? And in verse six, Jesus, he says, Jesus told, told them, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, which they did, you will also know my Father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And then Philip pipes in, Lord, show us the Father, and that's enough for us. Jesus just told them, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And so again, they're like, what are you talking about? Show us the Father. John 14, 15, a little farther down, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him, but you, but, but you do know him because he remains with you and will be with you or be in you. And then Judas, not the Judas Iscariot, another Judas says in verse 22, Lord, how is it that you're going to reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Do you feel the tension of this conversation? Jesus is telling them, hey, I'm about to leave. And they're like, whoa, well, hold on, hold on. No, 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 you can't do that. How will we know where to find you? You tell us we know the Father. No, no, show us the Father. Like, you can feel their anxiety because they don't have the Bible we have. Jesus is all they knew. And in verse 25, Jesus says, I have spoken these things to you while I remain with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you. And then we fast forward again, back to our original verse, 16, seven. Nevertheless, Jesus said, I am telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the Counselor will not come to you. If I go, I will send him to you. This is a fascinating conversation. You guys ever meet anybody or maybe at your job or you go to a new place or a new, so you go to a party with some people and, and someone comes to you and says, hey, I've got somebody you've got to meet. You ever heard that? I've had that. To me, that's the heart of what Jesus is doing here. Gentlemen, I have got someone you have got to meet. And so that's the heart of this series. You gathering I've got somebody you've got to meet. Because Jesus tells his disciples, I've got somebody you have to meet. In fact, it will be better for you to know him than for me to be with you. That's crazy town, right? What's better than Jesus with us? What could possibly be better? From Jesus' own words, it is to your benefit that I leave so that the Holy Spirit will be with you. <clears throat> Doesn't that make you curious? It makes me curious. It makes me wonder, what have I been missing out on my whole life? As a Christian kid, doing all the right things, checking the boxes, not doing the bad things, what am I missing? Because I missed this for a long, long time. You know why I missed it? Probably because the church I grew up in didn't want to talk about it. But later on, I had my own bias coming to the topic of the Holy Spirit. God the Father, check, no problem. Jesus, Savior of my soul, check, no problem. Holy Spirit, well, you know, I mean, those are weird people. 
100%. I went to a church growing up that was a little bit more spirit-led, and they had people running up and down the aisles with tambourines and flags, and I'm like, what is happening right now? Right? It was just so foreign to me that I just shut it off. It made me uncomfortable, so therefore, I turned off the spigot. What I would like to do during this series is turn that spigot on and say, God, what, what do you have for us that is so good that Jesus would say, it is better for you that I leave? What? What kind of goodness is Jesus offering us when he says, it is to your advantage, it is for your good that I leave? That's got to make us curious. What could I possibly be missing? I heard the Holy Spirit referred to as an it growing up. Still do. I heard the Holy Spirit referred to as a force like Star Wars. I heard, uh, you know, the Holy Ghost, which as any kid would say, like, no, thank you. I'm good. And what ended up happening in my life was the it, the force, and the ghost became irrelevant to me because it was uncomfortable for me. I wanted to control and be able to handle God the Father and God the Savior. I get that. Let's just just go with that, right? So here's here's the truth, though. The Holy Spirit is not something but someone. The Holy Spirit is not something he is a someone. Because when you look at the, old, the, the, the New Testament, the Gospels, Acts, and the, and the letters in the New Testament, what you see over, when you start reading the Bible with the lens looking for the Holy Spirit, he is all over the place. I mean, it's crazy town how often the Holy Spirit is talked about. And here's one thing that my wife and I, who Taylor's gonna be teaching half this series too, so I'm really excited for y'all. Um, we've been talking about this a lot, and, he, and this is one thing that she said that just stuck out to me, because this was a foreign concept to me growing up. And as you read through the Gospels and, and the New Testament, there is never any expectation that as you, a follower of Jesus that we would do anything without the Holy Spirit. Let me say that again. There is no expectation for you to follow Jesus, to do anything in the power of Jesus without the Holy Spirit. Is your faith dry? It's probably because the Holy Spirit's not involved. Are you bored with your faith? It's probably because the Holy Spirit's not involved. Is it unimportant to you? It's probably because the Holy Spirit's not involved. It's you grinding away, trying to find this life and life to the full by doing good and trying not to screw up. And then when you do, all the good washes down the toilet. God may strike me dead here, but here's how I think about this. If there is a secret sauce to Christianity, it is the Holy Spirit. He's the secret sauce. He's better than Chick-fil-A sauce. He's better than cane sauce, right? He is the spirit of God that dwells with you and in you. So if we're trying to do this faith thing and it is boring and tired and you're exhausted, my bet is because I have been there many times that you are trying to do it on your talents, on your abilities, on your time, and at your convenience. And here's the truth. I read a book, it's on the back table. The first line of the book caught my heart and my attention because the author says this, the Holy Spirit doesn't belong to you. So if we're requiring him to behave according to how we behave, you're trying to own the Holy Spirit and that ain't gonna happen and you're gonna have a dry, exhausted, grinded out mentality when it comes to your faith. The Holy Spirit's the secret sauce. 
And I can say that with confidence. I haven't been struck dead, so I'm gonna be, be hope, I think Jesus is okay with that. Then it starts to, it just starts to make sense that Jesus will say, it's better for you that I go so that my Holy Spirit will be with you. So let's get curious in this series. Over the next five weeks, let's drop our preconceived notions that the Holy Spirit's weird. It's for some weird denomination down the street with tambourines, right? Maybe you grew up like me in, in a denomination that says, no, the Holy Spirit's not, not doing his thing anymore. They're called cessationists. And I brought that baggage with me, that theological baggage. Can we just drop all the baggage over the next five weeks and just get curious together about who is the Holy Spirit? What does the Holy Spirit do? What can I expect from the Holy Spirit? How do I engage the Holy Spirit? That's where we're gonna go. So, before I get into my three points, we're probably already 20 minutes in, I'm sorry. I'll be honest with you, like I've, I, I, can, I can say with all integrity, I've not been this excited for a series Maybe ever. I just haven't. I'm really, not the other ones that weren't, I'm, I was excited about. It. But this one's gonna be fun. Because Jesus said, it is better that I leave so that my Holy Spirit will be with you. And if we honestly get curious together, this is what's going to happen at the end of this message. And this is what will happen at the end of this series. You will have more questions leaving tonight than you will have answers. There is no tight bow with the Holy Spirit. He's a wild ride. Heck, if you went on five dates with somebody, you wouldn't even have scratched the surface of who that person is. So for us to assume that we can have five weeks of the gathering and have a full embodied understanding of the Holy Spirit, we're crazy town. It's just the Holy Spirit. Let's just introduce ourselves to who is the spirit of God that he has given to us. So, John 14, verse 16, 15 and 16 is where we're gonna be tonight. Let me read it again. I've already read it once, but it was during the whole, the whole deal. Jesus says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. So my first point tonight is that the Holy Spirit is God. He is not an it, he is not a force. The Holy Spirit is God. Let me walk you through a couple scriptures beyond John 14. Jesus is talking, right, in John 14, he says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor. We see the Trinity right there. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. If you're not familiar with the word Trinity, it's God three in one. Three persons in one. It's a hard concept. We don't have time tonight, so just think water. H2O. Ice, liquid, and gas. It's all the same substance with three different, very different expressions. John, um, four, or, uh, in Genesis 1, verse 26, we see the Holy Spirit right in the beginning. It says, then God said, let us, the Trinity, make man in our image after our likeness. So right from the beginning, God's like, hey, it is us. We are creating, let's make man, humanity in our image, our image, plural image. In Acts 10, 38, I, this is maybe one of my next favorite verses that I'm, I've been marinating on recently. Peter is talking to Gentiles and he does not wanna share the gospel with them. He's not a big fan of Gentiles. But God says, you're gonna do it. He's like, you got it. What a great response to when God speaks. Absolutely. So he's telling the Gentiles who Jesus was. Listen to this. This is how Peter, who lived for three years with Jesus, describes. He says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power and how he went about doing good and healing all who were under the tyranny of the devil because God was with him. His spirit was with Jesus. That's why he could heal people. It was the Holy Spirit in Jesus. You see it again? You see God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. 
and we need to recognize and give him his due. He's not like the spirit of competition that we talk about or the spirit of generosity. That is a cheap and degrading way to think about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. And you see verse after verse, verse after verse. You, I mean, you could talk the baptism of Jesus. You see the same thing. Jesus is being baptized. God the Father has the Holy Spirit descend upon Jesus. All three working together for the same purpose. So the Holy Spirit is God. Number two, the Holy Spirit is Jesus' personal presence. Jesus, his personal presence is the Holy Spirit. In John 14, 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. Now, I'm a big fan of looking up what words mean in the original language, because every time we come to the Bible, it is a cross-cultural experience. In the Greek, that word another is a really important word. We could look at counselor, we're actually gonna look at the word counselor, perikletos, next week, a little bit more in depth. But that word another, Jesus says, and the Father will give you another counselor. Your Bible may say advocate or comforter to be with you forever. That word another has two Greek definitions. There's two words that can mean that idea. One is the, is the word heteros and the other is alos. The word heteros is meaning the same but different. It'd be like if I give, show you an apple and I say, hey, I'm gonna give you an orange. What's similar about them? They're both fruit, but they're different fruit, right? But the word alos means another of the same kind, and that's the word Jesus uses. I am going to give you another exactly like me. Not some weird version of me. I'm going to give you another counselor just like me. Maybe we'll put it this way. Let me frame it this way. Jesus and the Holy Spirit are best friends. Best friends. I was driving in the car with my kids the other day, and I asked one of my kids, who's your best friend? And my daughter yells out her best friend's name. I'm like, if you left our family, but she stayed, do you think she could represent you well? And she's like, oh yeah, we've been friends since we were like two. I'm like, what would she tell me? You know, like, and so we had this conversation. Because our best friend knows us. They can represent us really well most of the time. But Jesus says, my father is gonna give you another just like me to be with you forever. And so the Holy Spirit is Jesus' personal presence with us. And this is what the disciples were not getting. They're like, no, no, we're, we're losing you, Jesus. But he's like, hold up. I've got something better for you. My personal presence with you forever. You see, if we don't first acknowledge the Holy Spirit as God, then we probably shouldn't expect much interaction to happen because it's a degrading view. We need to understand the Holy Spirit as a person just like we understand Jesus as a person. Now, here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying the Holy Spirit is a person like Jesus. But throughout the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is personified over and over and over. He is given personal attributes. Why? Because he is the personal presence of Jesus. Here's just a few of the personalities, the personification of the Holy Spirit. In Romans 8, 27, we see that the Holy Spirit has a mind. In 1 Corinthians 12, we see that the Holy Spirit has a will. In Romans 15 and Galatians 5, we see that the Holy Spirit has emotions like love and joy. In Acts chapter 9, we see the Holy Spirit comforts. In Hebrews 3 and 1 Timothy 4, he speaks. In John 16 and 1 Corinthians, he teaches. In Ephesians 4, he can be made to feel sorrow. In Hebrews 10, the Holy Spirit can be insulted. In Acts 7, he can be resisted. In Acts 5, he can be lied to. The Holy Spirit 
is God. The Holy Spirit is Jesus' personal presence. He is a person. He's not an it. He is deity, not an entity. Moving on, the whole, my last point is the Holy Spirit is the believer's lifelong companion. John 14, 16, once again, I will ask the Father and he will give you another, just like me, counselor to be with you forever. And again, I told you earlier that word counselor is the word perikletos, which we will talk about more next week, but there's a, a pastor named John Bevere and he gives a great definition of this idea. He says this, the Holy Spirit is permanently called closely alongside each of us to provide coaching, direction, instruction, and counsel in our life journey. The Holy Spirit is permanently called. That is his, that's his role, his job, his calling, is to be the permanent companion of the believer. Can you imagine just going on a road trip to Dallas from Oklahoma City for three hours and there is someone in your passenger seat and we do not acknowledge them for three hours? Awkward. That would be awkward. But this is what I did in my life for a long, long time. I'm just not gonna, this is weird. I'm just gonna pretend like Jesus, Father, we're good. I'll take two thirds of the, of the Trinity. But the soul role of the Holy Spirit is to be with the believer. If you are a follower of Jesus, he indwells you. You don't ask the Holy Spirit or the Jesus in your heart, you ask the Holy Spirit in your heart. Jesus is currently, right now, sitting at the right hand of the Father. The Holy Spirit is the one that's in your heart. The Holy Spirit is with you. For how long? Forever. I'm a big fan of the Sandlot, so whenever I hear that word, I think of Squince Palidorus. Forever. Now, I don't know if about you, but there have been times in my life where I have said something to the effect of, if Jesus was just here with me, if Jesus was just sitting here across from me, next to me, walking with me, then everything would be okay. Guess what? He is. He is not sitting next to you. He is with you. He dwells inside of you as a believer and a follower of Jesus. Now here's the tension that we have to acknowledge. We live in a physical world. And what Jesus is talking about is the spiritual world. And this, there's tension here. I'm not gonna ignore it. This is how we function as human beings. Because we are limited, because we are hum human, and we have a humanness about us, what we want is physical Jesus because we have a physical existence. But Jesus says, no, nah, I'm gonna give you my spirit. And so we have the spiritual world and the physical world coming together here. And that's weird for us. Most of the problems in our world are spiritual problems that are trying to be figured out through physical means. That's why there's so much anger. That's why there's so much anxiety. That's why there's so much frustration is because we, we feel the physical problems, but it's not physical. It's actually a spiritual problem. And so Jesus gives us a spiritual solution. I will give you my spirit so and he'll be with you always, forever. And here's what I'm learning. If there's a practical tip, here's what I'm learning about this. The only way that I have learned to engage the Holy Spirit is not by going to church more. This is gonna sound blasphemous. It's not even reading the Bible more. The only way that we're, my sense of his presence with me has increased are two things. Slowing down. That's the first one. 
slowing down. Everything in our physical world says don't do that. You gotta produce, you need to be efficient with your time, you need to, you need to accumulate and achieve. The only thing that has helped me in this, as I am a baby walking towards this, is intentional slowness. Intentional stillness. And then all of a sudden I'm like, ah, oh. I remember Jesus often withdrew to a lonely place to pray. What was he doing? He was getting filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm convinced of it. People were clamoring for Jesus. They were desperate for him to heal and to feed and to bring sight to the blind. And Jesus said, no, there is something better and more important. I am going to slow down the role. I'm gonna get away by myself just with me and the Lord. Slowness. Quiet. And then the second part of that is don't get busy doing something while you're alone. Just sit there quietly and talk to the Lord and wait because you don't own the Holy Spirit. He's not on your schedule. Slow down. Talk to God. Listen. Most of the time I hear nothing. That is normal. It is my humanness that wants to hear something so desperately. Because I want this to be efficient. I want it to be productive. I don't want to look like an idiot. Jesus said, I gotta go away. I gotta get by myself. So why, if Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, said this is a priority for me, why would we not do this? Because we're human. And we got stuff to do. God has given me gifts and talents and I need to use them for his kingdom glory. And along the way, we miss out on the Holy Spirit. And then we wonder why we're burned out, tired, exhausted, and bored. Because I'll say this again. I think you may have said this earlier. I kind of lose myself here, but... When you read, again, when you read the Bible, especially the Gospels and the book of Acts, Jesus did nothing without the Holy Spirit. So why do we try? What do I mean by that? I mean in Luke chapter one, Jesus is born by the Spirit. In Luke three, he is anointed with the Spirit. In John 33, he is filled without measure with the Spirit. In Luke 4 and Acts 10, we see that Jesus is empowered by the Spirit. And in the end, we see that Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, is raised from the dead. Jesus did nothing without the Holy Spirit. They are besties. They're best friends. Where one is, so is the other. And Jesus said, you know what? I'm going to leave my best friend with you the believer. Holy Spirit is probably, I don't think I'm going on a limb here, probably the most ignored person in the church. He's probably the most ignored person in the Bible. Yet he is called to be our permanent companion. Why would we not acknowledge his presence every time we open our eyes? Why would we not acknowledge his presence when we go into that meeting? Why would we not acknowledge his presence when we begin worship? He is with us. He is worshiping along with us. One thing I love about when we worship is my affections for Jesus increase. That ain't me. (laughs) That is the Holy Spirit saying, let's go, Andy. Come on, this is what you need. And all of a sudden I start worshiping different than I do to the country music in my car. It's because the Holy Spirit's like this, this is what your soul needs. To focus your heart on God. And so why would we not? 
Why would we not slow down? I have a theory why we don't slow down like Jesus. Is because slowness, like I said earlier, is not efficient. It does not produce and it doesn't make me feel important. It actually makes me feel more like a fool and like I'm wasting my time. And you know what? That's really good for me. Because here's the the, the other part of this is slowness produces a greater awareness of our need and dependence for God. Some of us don't slow down because we're scared of what we'll think about when we slow down. Because when we slow down, things come to our mind, come out of our, the depths of our soul, and it makes us uncomfortable, we don't like it, I'm, I'm gonna get busy so I don't think about it. But be, being slow and still before the Lord will make you more aware of your desperate dependence on God. And I just wonder, is that, is that the benefit? Is that the advantage? I think it is. The benefit is that you and I as believers will become more and more and more dependent on the presence of the Holy Spirit. And that is where we find life and life to the full. Not in a great worship set, not in a late night, not in a great day at work, not in a raise, not in a move where I finally get into that house. That's not life and life to the full that Jesus is talking about. If he's saying it is better that I leave so the Holy Spirit will come, and then Jesus says, I have come to give you life and life to the full. What is he talking about? Life with the Holy Spirit. That is life and life to the full. Our acknowledgement and awareness that the Holy Spirit of God dwells in us, and he is our counselor and he's our advocate, he is our strengthener, he is our comforter, he is our guide and our teacher. I mean, come on. Now I hope you start to start to feel why I'm excited for this series. Because for way too long, I just didn't, I was oblivious. And when you brought it up, I didn't want to hear it. So here's where we've been tonight. Number one, Holy Spirit is God. Number two, Holy Spirit is Jesus. Jesus is personal presence. And thirdly, Holy Spirit is the believer's lifelong companion. So what? What? I wanna give you four tonight, we get a bonus. Number one, I wanna ask you to start shifting how we think about the Holy Spirit. Whatever you came into this topic with, when you saw the, the social media post, Holy Spirit, whatever that reaction was, lay it to the side. And say, Jesus, teach me. Because next week, we're just gonna, again, we're gonna look more at the words of Jesus about the Holy Spirit. You're not gonna get a denominational line. You're not gonna get a crossings line. You're gonna get a Jesus line. And if we're gonna be Jesus followers, we need to empty ourselves of what we, our preconceived notions, and say, Jesus, teach me. Number two, get curious about life alongside the Holy Spirit. Would you get curious? Like, hmm, I wonder what, I wonder how. And just get curious. Go, go back and read John 14, 15, and 16. John 15 is that famous passage. If, I, if you abide in me, I will abide in you, right? What is he talking about? Holy Spirit. It's not Jesus. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. It is the Holy Spirit that I will send to you who will abide in you, and we will be together. Thirdly, Ask the Holy Spirit to increase your awareness of him. Help me know that you're here. Help me get a sense of your presence with me. Here's the cool thing. You've probably heard, you probably have heard at least one sermon on the Holy Spirit from Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. And you know how I heard that growing up? Be more patient. Be more joyful. Right? Instead of, no, that's not the passage. This is the fruit. This is what is produced in us from the Holy Spirit. It's not a striving. It's not a, I'm gonna grind my way to kindness. No, that's exhausting. But when you start to regularly sit quietly before the Lord 
and let him do what he wants to do because you do not own the Holy Spirit. What will be produced in you is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. So ask the Holy Spirit to be, make you more aware of his presence. And then lastly, this is the practical one, you knew it was coming. I wanna challenge you to slow down and make room for the Holy Spirit. That's a hard concept because that's a spiritual concept in a physical world. Lean into it. Find a place in your home. For me, I can't sit. I get too fidgety. So I go for a walk by myself early in the morning. I just walk. And I talk to God. And sometimes he, he gives me a thought, and sometimes I got nothing. But I want to make myself available. Do you have room in your schedule for the Holy Spirit? Do you? Make room. You make room, I make room for what's important. And I wanna raise the value. Not because I got some agenda other than Jesus raised the value. He said the presence of the Holy Spirit is better than me being with you. One more time, John 16, seven, nevertheless, I am telling you the truth. It is for your benefit, for your good. It is better in your advantage that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. The Holy Spirit is God's permanent presence with us, with you. I'm gonna give you this parting thought to answer the question, why is it better? Because you may be sitting here just like, I'm like, it would still be better to have Jesus right here rolling with me to work. I can come home and be like, hey, this is what happened, what do I do, right? But we're humans, guys. Have you ever been to Disney World and tried to get on a ride? You're probably waiting 90 minutes. If Jesus said, you know what, I'm gonna stick around forever. What are the chances that in your lifetime you're actually gonna get to talk to Jesus? You have to fly to the Middle East, get in line with every, all the rest of humanity, and if you're not rich enough, you're not gonna buy a fast pass. And you might, you might get 30 seconds. But Jesus said, I know humanity. I know what you will need. You will need 24-7, 365 access to me, and I am going to give it to you. And so then when I start thinking like, yeah, that makes total sense. That it is to my advantage. It is better for you that the Holy Spirit come because I would not be able to stand in line that long. So why would we go another minute of our lives acknowledging and not depending on the presence of the Spirit within us. We're gonna leave our so what's up on the screen, and I'm gonna pray. If you're new, so what is just a little bit of process time. It's gonna give you 120 seconds to slow down and ask the Holy Spirit, help me be more aware of your presence. And let's just see what he does over the next five weeks as we introduce, <laughs> this sounds so bad, the best part of Jesus, his spirit. Let me pray. God, thank you. God, thank you for your infinite wisdom and your deep love for us and your deep understanding of what we would need. Because God, honestly, if you said, Andy, what do you need? I would say, Jesus. That would be my response, I need Jesus. But you have already done that. So Holy Spirit, I'm praying to you because you are God. Would you make us more aware of your presence? Would you open our spiritual eyes in this physical world that we may feel and sense your presence with us? Would you speak, would you lead, would you guide and teach? Would you convict and would you comfort us? We pray these things in your name, amen.